Think about everything you touch in a day. Now think about how much of it is plastic. Plastics are amazing materials. They're lightweight, but strong, flexible, but impermeable. They're in our cars, planes, hospitals, weapons, and electronics. Plastic is everywhere. But of course, that's the problem. Plastic is everywhere. More importantly, plastics don't biodegrade. That water bottle you use for 10 minutes, it could take 500 years or more to fully decompose. Most plastics that we use are single-use, short-time-use packaging, and then they're discarded. That mismatch between plastic's short use and long life results in an overflow of plastic waste. Think about how crazy this is. To get the raw materials for plastics, we spend billions pulling fossil fuels out of the earth, then we pollute the earth to make plastics, and then we toss those plastics right back into the ground where they came from. I think 50 years from now, what will happen is people will be digging out uh, landfills and taking out product to recycle, and they will think we are crazy people of dumping things in landfills. So we should just get rid of plastic. Small problem. There is nothing better at doing what plastic does than plastic. When it comes to its low cost, versatility, and durability, the plastic we use today is unbeatable. We're not going to get rid of plastics anytime soon, so we better deal with them in a more intelligent way from where they come from and also where they go after we're done using them. That means two things. We have to develop new, environmentally friendly materials that can replace petroleum-based plastics, and we have to find a way to clean up the plastics we've already discarded. One of the teams that's developing a sustainable replacement for plastic is here, in this lab at the Center for Sustainable Polymers at the University of Minnesota. The majority of plastics that we use now are from petroleum. And by majority, I mean more than 90%, maybe more than 95. But the team at this lab is trying to change that. They are trying to totally rethink where a plastic can come from. Could you make a plastic of living materials like plants or bacteria? One of the common misconceptions in the world of plastic is that there's plastic. Well, actually, there's several different varieties of plastic. You, you're familiar with recycling symbols. There's seven of those. So there's no one plastic that will replace all plastics. At the lab, researchers are working on several types of bioplastics. That's plastic made out of renewable resources that could be used for everything from the soles of shoes to housing insulation. The latest breakthrough is a new type of foam that could replace petroleum-based cushioning, like what's in car seats and bedding. And it all starts with bacteria. It's E. coli, it's Escherichia coli, so that's the strain that we use for our experiments. The E. coli is genetically modified, meaning it's given a new set of instructions, in this case to synthesize molecules that can be polymerized to create new materials. Then they're fed sugar, shaken, and fermented. The byproduct of this process is a molecule that's a precursor to plastic. When mixed with a catalyst in the lab, the chemical reaction produces this bubbling gel-like substance. When it hardens, you've got foam. So it's still pretty sticky, but this can then be cut and thrown into pillows. The main reason that I think this is important is because the feedstock is renewable. There's an endless supply of bacteria and sugar, a far cry from petroleum, which is limited in supply and expensive to find. So that's where the foam comes from, but what happens when it's time to throw it away, when you're ready to get rid of that car seat or pillow? Most foams aren't recycled, and if they are, they're chopped up and broken into a degraded material. But if this foam is collected, it can be chemically broken back down into the same precursor they started with which can then be used to create new foams over and over again.
The lab is also working on a replacement for rubber in things like shoes, tires, sporting equipment, or household items. So we want to look for rubbery materials, things that are stretchy, that are elastic, that can be extended and they snap right back. This process starts with starch from corn. Chemists can synthesize the polymer in the lab, dry it, and then mold it. Once we form some of the rubbers that we use today, we can't reprocess them. They can just be ground up and make the playground rubber material. But this you can melt and reprocess and reuse it. And it's compostable. That's what we strive for, right? Because we don't want to have our ocean filled with plastics. So why aren't materials like this in all of our couches and shoes already? So I oftentimes joke that my lab has produced a lot of materials that have interesting and exciting properties, but nobody really cares about them. That's because the bioplastics in this lab are still relatively expensive to produce, especially now with oil prices so low. The unfortunate reality is that consumers like you will not pay a premium for bio-renewability or degradability, or not much of a premium. An ideal bioplastic would not only look and perform as well as petroleum-based plastics, it'd be just as cheap and easy to produce. It probably won't look any different. I'll still grab the bag to put my fruit in at the grocery store, except it'll be from bio-based feedstocks. And except when I throw it away, it'll have a facile route to decomposition to give environmentally innocuous byproducts. If this lab succeeds, a better world might look a lot like the one we already live in. Bioplastics may be a few years out, but there are steps we can take today to help clean up the plastic we've already used. We're at Carbon Light Industries in Riverside, California. It's a plastics recycling plant, one that specializes in recycling a type of plastic called PET that you find in most soda and water bottles. Every day, 300,000 pounds of plastic bottles arrive in bales. That's three billion bottles a year. They're sent through a maze of high-tech machines that sort, clean, melt, and sanitize them. It's what you think of when you think of a recycling plant, except Carbon Light does something few recyclers are actually able to do, turn plastic bottles back into material for new plastic bottles. This is Leon Farinick, founder and CEO of Carbon Light. By the way, Leon's been in plastics for a long time. He ran one of the first companies that introduced plastic bags to grocery stores in the 80s. I feel that, okay, I brought grocery sacks and all that. Now I'm, what do you call it, redeeming myself and I'm doing recycling. Until recently, most plastic bottles collected for recycling in the U.S. were sent overseas. A lot of the bottles that was collected in California, for example, or other places were being shipped to China. So what the Chinese would do would take the bottles, transform it into a lesser material like a carpet, like fabric, and then ship it back to us. Bottle to bottle, like what we do, that we call it cradle to cradle, that, that happens a lot less. What most people don't realize is when they throw a plastic water bottle into a blue or green recycling bin, that bottle's less likely to become another bottle than it is to become something else, like carpet or teddy bear stuffing. And if it winds up living a second life as carpeting or teddy bear stuffing, then it more than likely ends its recyclable life there. That's because those materials are harder to collect and recycle. Why not just turn old plastic bottles into new ones? Well, it's expensive and you have to have a very sophisticated facility like this one to be able to make the necessary material for people to use it for their beverages. Jeff Walsh, Vice President of Operations, took us around to show us the inner workings. Okay, so this is where the process starts. Each one of these bales weighs about 1,300 pounds or so. First, bottles are broken out of bales. Trash and non-PET materials are separated using optical sorters. Then a rinse cycle begins to remove labels and caps. Colored and clear materials are separated, then they get crushed and hot washed. 
Finally, the bottles are ground into what Carbon Light calls cornflake. This flake is like gold. This is what we use to make the food grade material that we sell to our customers. The last step is melting the flake and cutting it into beads. Jose Valle is the quality control manager at the on-site lab. We operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and our sole purpose is to test. The lab tests the product to make sure it meets manufacturer's standards for safety and structural integrity. With the most recent dip in oil prices, Farinix says plastics derived from petroleum are currently cheaper than Carbon Light's recycled material. Even so, customers like Nestle and Pepsi still buy Carbon Light's product to use in some of their bottles. After all, who doesn't like to see an Earth-friendly logo on their 15 ounces of acai machine? This is our problem. Uh, it will be a shame to 50 years from now people are suffering. This is right for the environment. It's, it's really a huge issue and we have to take care of it.